Hey folks, it's Artwolf. Welcome. Today we have a Traveler Tuesday, which is back. We are going to have a look at the recently released in PDF and soon enough to release in hard copy World Builders Handbook for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. Now those of us who've been around since the Digest Group days will remember the old and very good uh, book from Digest Group for Mega Traveler, and this promises to be an equivalent book for, for a Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. Cross compatibility is pretty high anyway. You, you've got the old Digest Group book. You could probably just use it. Uh, but it, it is a long-awaited update to that book is coming right here. And what we have here is a 258-page book. So this is uh, presumably going to be a hardcover upon release. And I don't know if they're going to do uh, separate like record sheets or anything like that. So we've got... Uh, right on the first page, we've got a pretty nice cover and a the typical skeletal mongoose table of contents, which I've complained about before, a minor complaint, admittedly. I think they could do better here, uh, but not really a huge crisis. Uh, author is Gear Laniskog, who has been doing excellent work for a mongoose traveler second edition. So let's uh, let's start our flip through here. Okay, so we have the introduction. Uh, we have a discussion of how to use the World Builders Handbook. And I'm going to read this, actually, because it's fairly short and should give us some perspective as to kind of where the author is coming from. This book goes into great detail about the processes of world generation, including how to fully create atmospheres, the creation of weather systems, calculating all socioeconomic factors required for a functioning world. Very interested in seeing how that works. Uh, the referee is free to use as much or as little information as they like, and it may be beneficial to only use what is truly necessary to begin with uh, in order to familiarize yourself with the systems they're in. Okay, so we've got two different, well, let's see. We've got three different creation methods. We've got the expanded method, which is pretty much uh, you've generated your subsector map and you know that there's a system in the hex and you don't know anything else. There's the continuation method, which is what you use when you've already done the main world, or if you're working from an existing sector for which you only, or subsector, or system, uh, for which you only have the main world. Now, for those not familiar, the Traveler standard world generation system, that's kind of been the core of Traveler since 1977, only generates what we call the main world, or the most important world in the system. That may or may not be the most populated planet, that may or may not be the most resource-rich world in the system. Um, it's kind of arbitrary, and you can sort of wave your hands at this you, in, in for in-universe reasons by saying, well, you know, when the scouts came through here 40 years ago or whatever it was, they designated this to be the most important world in the system. So that's the main world. That's the world that you have the UWP for. Circumstances may have changed since then, or the scouts may have simply been full of it when they came through. So you always kind of have that carte blanche as the referee to decide, hey, this is what the scouts said, but scouts haven't been here in a while on any official record-keeping mission. Um, so you can kind of treat that how you want. You, you treat the numbers as they are, and that's kind of the magic of the Traveler world creation and kind of figure out what's going from there. But beyond that, it is up to you, the referee, to determine how that actually works in play. We also have the categorization method. I'm not sure what that is. If all or most of the information about a system already exists from other sources, uh, categorization method is an extreme example of the continuation method. Okay, so that's like uh, continuation on steroids. So we've got a dice system. That's very interesting. Uh, Traveler's based on standard six-sided dice, but there are there is also a D66 roll where you treat one die, one die six as the tens die and one die six as the ones die. And that gives you a result from 11 to 66. This is actually giving you something new. Uh, here is a, 2D, a D26 method, which is a way to emulate a D10. Man, I've got D10s. I'm okay with this. Okay, so some procedures in this book require a linear result of 1 to 9 or 1, or 0 to 9 or 1 to 10. Um, I, I would be happy to just use a D10 for that. Uh, back in 1977... I think it it couldn't be safely assumed that somebody that wasn't already playing D&D, for example, had access to D10s. And in fact, early D10s were in fact D20s numbered 1 to 10 twice. And that was the case of the first several years of the hobby's existence. 
Uh, nowadays, it is, of course, trivial to get your hands on D10s. Amazon has them, if nothing else. So if you don't have D10s, I okay, get some on Amazon and don't do not do this. This is, you're, you're not getting a linear result with this. I would not use this. All right, units, uh, metric system and Kelvin, rounding numbers, expanded hex code. This has been sort of part of Traveler since the beginning where the original books used uh, hexadecimal, where uh, a, a, which enabled a very compact notation. Okay. Nowadays, we use what we call e-hex or pseudo-hex or expanded hex or something like that, where it doesn't cut off at a value of 16, which would be F. Um, now it goes all the way to 33. And they, we leave out the I and the O out of the letters uh, to prevent confusion uh, with the numbers 1 and 0. So real basic stuff on the first couple of pages here. Uh, IISS Overview. This is the Imperial Interstellar, Interstellar Scout Service. And we're getting a considerable number, as we did in the old uh, Digest Group book, actually, a considerable amount of information on how the Scout Service actually works. Um, here is Survey Operations. So there are five different classes of surveys or levels of surveys, one of which is you pop in, look around, and pop back out, and whatever information you get, um, that's what you report. And class five on the other extreme is you went in, spent weeks or months there to study all of the bodies in detail. It's a much more thorough uh, analysis. And then you have a survey index, which kind of quantifies that actual data. So zero is there's no data. Uh, 12 all the way at the top is we've detected even like Oort cloud bodies out in the outer system. Um, stars. Okay, we have star classification. And most versions of Traveler have included this. So like I mentioned before, you've got the main world, but that doesn't give you any information about the system itself. How many stars are there? What classes are they? How many other planets are there? You are not told that. And the uh, referee is, you know, free to make that stuff up. Um, for a lot of referees, that's completely fine, and you can just wing that. But then you've got to take notes and, you know, have or have it all figured out in advance. And if you're the type that wants to figure it all out in advance, here we have the actual mechanism for doing that. Now, most versions of Traveler have included this at some level. For Classic Traveler, we had the Scouts book, which gave us a lot of information on A, how the Scouts work, and B, this expanded system stuff. For Mega Traveler, we had an expanded star system generation in the core game, and then we had the World Builders Handbook to provide even more detail than that. And this is kind of giving us the Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition equivalent of both that expanded character uh, star system generation that was in Mega Traveler plus the stuff, or at least an equivalent of the stuff that was in the World Builders Handbook. So we got all the primary star types that are possible here. Um, we have subtypes. Uh, do we have rules for multi-star systems? One would presume that that's here somewhere, since that is astrographically very common. Star mass and temperature, star diameter. And I would assume that this is at least somewhat caught up with uh, modern astrophysics, as opposed to the 77 assumptions, which were, you know, not. Uh, not anymore, right? At, at the time, they were not totally out of line with what we thought was actually going on in the universe, now we know that a lot of those assumptions were maybe not great, but there are other reasons inside the tr official travel universe or in your official travel universe, if you want, to want to vary those assumptions. Um, so we get star diameters and luminosities by class. We have a bunch of math. Okay, so I want to emphasize, there's a bunch of formulas on this page, which do include some squares, and I think we're probably going to see a square root somewhere as well. Remember that this is a supplement to the standard method. Um, you can use, as the book says at the beginning, as much or as little of this as you want. Now, how I would handle this is I would plug all of this crap into a spreadsheet and have the spreadsheet do it for me. Uh, that can go up to and include any random roles that may be required. Um, we've got here, ah, systems with multiple stars, so we got that. Uh, we've got star ages. That's actually pretty cool to have. Uh, systems with multiple stars, as mentioned. Default star, star designations. Um, the standard system for de designating stars and their orbiting planets used by astronomers now is somewhat different from the typical science fiction method that we typically see in science fiction. 
Um, Traveler has gone with the the way that we do it in science fiction, which is completely fine by me since it is in fact science fiction. All right, eccentricity. Uh, this is very detailed. Stellar classes and types for multi-star systems. System age adjustment. Okay, star system, uh, star orbit period. Two large masses toward each other. And there's our square root. If we had, haven't had one before. Uh, yep, that's the first square root. Again, Excel can handle this. Star system profile. The IISS shorthand profile for a star system has two formats: one for a single star and one for a multi-star system. I'll also mention here that the the sort of canonical default standard for Traveler for UWPs is currently the Traveler 5 format that is available in Traveler 5th edition. And if you look at the stuff in TravelerMap.com, which I highly recommend you do, amazing resource for really any science fiction RPG, uh, but it's pointed at Traveler, uh, you'll find that those are, those at least the updated sectors are Traveler 5 format. Um, for the core UWP itself, there's basically no important differences, but when you start getting into like the economic extensions and all those things, then that becomes somewhat different. Um, so we, we do have a star system profile here in two different formats, and I don't expect this to align with the T5 format, at least at this level. All right. Uh, here are some examples that we start here, which is good. The Z system, the Corella system. Um, this, the, uh, at least Corella is an actual system somewhere. Uh, where does it say that is? It doesn't actually, ah, here we go. Sector location. So store sector 0602, and then Corella is in the beyond 0314. Now the beyond sector is covered in some very old books by Paranoia Press, which I don't recommend. And the, uh, Spinward Fringe book by author Gear Laniscog from Mongoose Publishing. That book I do recommend. Uh, that fixes basically all the problems with the old paranoia press subsectors. All right, system worlds and orbits. Here's where you actually place planets and those type of bodies here. Uh, this is pretty much exactly what I wanted on this out of this book, to be honest. We'll see how much more we get. Uh, you've got a bunch more square roots. Again, Excel is your answer there. Placement of worlds. Um, we're still in that system spread, placing orbit numbers, add anomalous planets, uh, planetary orbital periods. That's awesome that you get that information. Basic world sizing based on the UWP code, significant moons, significant moon sizes, planetary system profiles, main world candidates. So if the main world is not yet designated, here's how you figure out which world the main world is. Um, here's the IISS procedural, which I think is telling me um, exactly how the scouts execute those types of surveys. And here we have the form for that. Like I said, I hope that these are printer friendly. So uh, printing out these individual pages out of the PDF is not going to be a problem, but I hope that Mongoose will make those available at some point. Maybe they already have and I haven't checked. Um, all right, here we have some examples from the Z and Corella systems. Oh, and we get cool maps too. That's neat. Uh, and here's Terra Sol, um, Solomani Rim, Solomani Rim, 1827. Solomani is the, is the, is the better pronunciation of that. We're from, we're from Ohio here. We could pronounce that however we want, but Solomani is the, is probably the right way to do it. All right. World physical characteristics. Uh, we don't have the, we don't have planet nine on this map. That's, uh, that's interesting that they've made that choice. Many science fiction settings do in fact include uh, undiscovered planets as of today, uh, but this one does not. All right, world physical characteristics. This is where we're getting into the interesting stuff. And this, of course, is the stuff that's covered by the UWP, um, but this is giving us more detail, like what's the gravity, what's the mass, what's the escape velocity, what's the orbital velocity, um, size profile, there's size profiles, planetoid belt characteristics. Uh, planetoid belts, of course, have been a mainstay of Traveler forever. Uh, characteristics of significant moons and rings. Uh, there's a lot of math here. Um, again, and I'm going to emphasize this, and I'll probably mention it at least one more time. If you're not comfortable using all this math, just don't. It's okay. Uh, just pick the values, values that make sense to you. If it comes to that, probably you don't really have to worry about it, right? You, 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 you develop as you need, unless you are the type that needs to obsessively develop everything in advance, in which case here, Bob's your uncle and, and this book would be Bob. Here's more details on atmospheres, which has been, you know, 
something I've wanted to see for a long time is like, okay, so unusual gas, helium, gas, hydrogen. How do we interpret tainted? That's always been left up to the referee historically. And that's fine, right? Is it tainted because there's like a toxic gaseous element there? Or is it tainted because there is uh, industrial pollutants? What does tainted mean? You know, that's never been, I don't want to say never, but never in the, in the core systems has that been comprehensively, you don't really want to define it comprehensively. Because again, then you are sucking the magic out of Traveler UWPs. You, you, the, the magic is you look at these numbers, whether they make sense or not is kind of the fun of it. Uh, you make them make sense. Um, and the flexibility to decide for yourself what tainted means and what insidious means and what corrosive means um, is part of the fun. Um, so you, uh, but again, you know, this is all modular. You can use this or not, uh, atmosphere profile, taint, severity, and persistence. That's probably going to get us demonetized subtypes exotic. Okay. So we've got, uh, so some information on those and you know, subtype exotic is a range of different things, right? So it's not just like, ah, oh, it's a, uh, uh, ammonia methane atmosphere. Well, maybe, but it doesn't have to be, um, and we've got uh, details on quite a lot of the details, corrosive and insidious. We get some information on those. If nothing else, this is going to provide you with grist for those imaginative gears um, to uh, to determine for yourself what those UWP codes mean when they come up. Um, we've got a whole bunch of atmosphere uh, numbers here. What color is the sky? The color of the sky on Mars ought to be blue. But it isn't. It isn't because of atmospheric dust kicked up by the winds, because it does have something of an atmosphere. Non-habitable zone atmospheres, hot and cold. Atmosphere gas mixes, very interesting. A uh, lot of good uh, incidental detail for you here. And we've got a number of different categories here. Boiling atmospheres, hot atmospheres, temperate atmospheres, cold atmospheres, and frozen atmospheres. A uh, krypton atmosphere. That would be unusual. Let's put it that way. Hydrographics, we are going to probably see a different, uh, a, a similar but different level of detail on hydrographics, right? And this is another one of those things where you've always kind of been up to your own devices or, if you will, your own imagination in figuring out what these things mean. Uh, days in the year and solar days, we determined that before, I believe. Oh, no, actually, we figured that out here because the day is the rotation time and the year is the orbital time. So we actually figured out the uh, the standard years of orbital time before now we're figuring out the number of days in the year so that's pretty cool tidal forces uh discussion of tidally locked worlds those turn out to be you know modern astrophysics says that's very common um and we there's a bunch of examples of that in the solar system in fact i think all four of the big moons of jupiter are in fact tidally locked surface tidal effects and it in fact our moon is tidally locked as well um, which basically means that its orbital period is equal to its rotational period. So it always faces the same way uh, from the uh, reference frame of the body it's orbiting. Here's mean temperature, uh, albedo and greenhouse factor, temperature and Moarn. Uh, so Moarn is, is a, I, I want to say a Mark Miller uh, af aphorism that says map only as, as really necessary. Uh, and that applies to everything in this book. If you don't really need it, you don't really need to generate it in advance. But you can if you want to. High and low temperatures. And of course, if you were to algor uh, algorithmically set this up, what you would end up with is a way to very easily say, okay, I'm going to run Deep Night Revelation where we're going to go the 50 sectors or whatever it is to the, the, the edge of the spiral arm. Um, the book doesn't give you the... you gives you very little UWPs uh, of that and actually recommends you don't generate those. But you can algorithmically generate stuff subsector by subsector or sector by sector now using existing tools. And I would do that. I would say, okay, you're entering a new subsector. Boom, here, here it is. Okay, you've, you, here's, here's the system map. Um, now you can go and kind of figure out your route, right? All right, high and low temperatures, additional temperature scenarios. There's a lot here, and this is super detailed. And so far, we'll see when we get to the, you know, when we stop getting, uh, when we start getting away from these physical characteristics, 
uh, we will start seeing, uh, I think what is going to end up being potentially the more interesting part of the book, which is when we get into um, the, the social uh, parts of the UWP, seismology, residual residual seismic stress and heating. Uh, a chapter heading I never thought I would see in an RPG book, frankly. Uh, native life forms, cool that we're getting this. There's a biomass rating, biocomplexity rating, native sofonts. Do we get a, mm, yeah, we get an actual roll on that. Awesome. Uh, resource rating, habitability rating, final main world determination. Okay, main world mapping. Uh, and here we get some, the, the standard uh, Icosa graphic uh, hex map, or 20-sided for those of us who have grown up in gaming, um, hex maps for planets. And here's uh, the, the 2.5 hexes map and the 7 hexes map. And here you can zoom into any of those individual hexes. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So you can kind of, again, de modularly develop this to whatever extent you feel is necessary. If you're going to run like, uh, let's say you're going to run a Dune-like campaign. And I don't mean Dune-like as in the sense of, ah, you're competing interstellar noble houses. I mean that most or all of the action of your campaign is going to happen on a single planet. Then maybe you run through this entire book to determine all the parameters of that planet. Or you make your own decisions to suit the nature of the campaign. So... A uh, lot of detail here. More on the survey uh, mechan the survey procedures that scouts do. Um, here are our examples. We have here, uh, this is the Z system or whatever it's called, Z prime, yep. Uh, here's Corella, we got tons of info on here. Um, here is Terra. World of social characteristics. We are roughly halfway through the book. And we're now getting to this. Okay, so the prerequisite is the initial UWP and trade code completion, which any standard traveler algorithmic uh, sector or subsector designer will give you this. Or you can just follow the relatively straightforward process in the core book, which if you, whichever core book you're using, if you, uh, other than like the first couple of times where you're looking up how to do it, that should take no more than five minutes. All right. Population. We've got a bunch of stuff, uh, additional significant digits on population. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, you notice this table goes all the way up to pop 12, which is population in the trillions. Um, I don't know if there are any canonical planets with populations that high, but if you like run the numbers and look at a, like a hive city, like a Coruscant or a Trantor, if you're familiar with that, um, you'll find that the population that a planet built up in that way can support is well into the trillions. Now how, you know, fast the population goes up is kind of another question. All right, population, but this is, you know, uh, several thousand years in the future too, so there's a lot of time. Demographics, population concentration, urbanization percentage, very interesting. Major city population, 100% is at uh, urbanization 13, by the way. And we do get a, let's see, extremely concentrated would give us, uh, so nine, a PCR would be nine. And then we get a trade code. Uh, so let's say we have a higher TL and it's industrial. And so let's call it a, a plus three. Then your average roll on this 2D plus is going to be a 10, which is going to give you about an 80 some percent urbanization percentage, which sounds about right for like a, a high middle tech levels, to be honest. Uh, no, that does pass the, the eyeball test here. Number of major cities, major city population. Boy, we're getting a lot of detail. Additional cities, unusual cities, population profile, capital designation codes. Uh, that's if it's like a, like a sector or subsector capital or something like that. Uh, government. Balkanized government, which is a favorite uh, of Traveler traditionally. Okay. Uh, we don't have a lot of information on the other, maybe it's just not yet, but Balkanized government, which is seven government number, um, is basically there's a bunch of different individual governments on the planet. And it's relatively common because it's a seven, right? Um, although there are DRMs to that role, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, the higher you go on the scale, the more repressive the government tends to be. Um, government structure, authority, government profile, faction relationships, law level, judicial system, 
interesting. Um, economic law. There's a bunch of different things here. So another like traditional thing that the law level only really affects, sometimes you make a roll on it, right? But uh, normally like out of the box, it only really affects the legality of weapons. Um, and of course, law is a lot more complicated than that. And this gives you at least some tools for fleshing that raw number out. Uh, they talk about personal rights, the criminal system, private law versus pub public law or criminal law, uh, criminal law penalties. All these things will presumably figure into the law levels. Uh, secondary world law levels. So presumably this is like the, not the main world. Here's technology. And this has been a bit of a gap in Traveler, to be honest. There's like a lot of technological assumptions built into Traveler. In some cases, uh, because of conscious choices that was made by Mark Miller, who the main designer and the other folks who helped, to whatever extent that happened. Um, there's a lot of assumptions built into the technology, some of which were choices and some of which were uh, just limitations of what they knew and could readily access in 1976 and 1977 when they were working on this thing. Um, and as a result, the, the like the detailed tech levels really stop at about 15, right? You don't have a whole lot on what, what is available at tech level 16, even though there are a couple of six, TL-16 planets floating around in the canonical universe, let alone what is possible at, say, 16, 17, 18, so there's like a gap there between, you know, here's where the travel universe is right now, um, at least at maximum. And then sort of where the ancients were at presumably like TL-25 or whatever it was, um, where they have shit that seems like actually magical. Um, so one thing I would like to see, and T5 does go into this to some extent, but not to the extent that I would like to see. What I would like to see is like a technology guide for whatever Traveler Mongoose. Mongoose, if you're listening, go ahead and do that book. I would be happy for Gear Laniscog to write that. Um, that would cover all the tech levels in detail up to about TL 18 or 20, right? So you could kind of map out technological progress beyond what is possible or have isolated enclaves of, say, TL 17 stuff either because it's prototypes or lost civilization or whatever. There's plenty of reasons to do that. But give me some something to work with, right? Give me some structure in which to fit my Clark Tech technology. Um, this book does not do that. Uh, high and low common tech levels. And again, you know, tech level is kind of one of those things that you can, or you have some flexibility as the referee to how, how you interpret that. Do you interpret that as like every corner store is selling TL, if the world level is TL14, is that just everybody's got TL14 stuff, it's super common, or does that mean that the industrial base is capable of TL14? So you might have higher stuff, um, but th that means it's imported, right? That is not determined by that tech level number you see at the end of the UWP. You can figure that out on a case-by-case -case basis. Or does it mean that the tech level was, was 14 30 years ago when the scouts came through and now it's 15 or now there was a, you know, a nuclear war here and now it's, a, now it's a four, right? So you're, you're capable, you, you are given license as the referee to make those adjustments um, as necessary and to make those determinations uh, as suits your preferences and the needs of your campaign. All right, so tech level profile, ooh, nice. Okay, um, so what does this mean? UWP TL of eight, have an ability rating of seven. Okay, requirement of TL three for its minimum sustainable tech level. Uh, UWP TL becomes the high common TL. Okay, so you get an explanation of this, uh, of, of all the things that I just described, and then you get a tech level profile that covers these other kind of parameters inside that. Um, so you get uh, the common tech level, balkanized government tech levels, quality of life tech levels, electronics, manufacturing, medical, environmental, land transport, water transport. So a bunch of additional detail is here and available to be generated if you want it. Culture. Okay. Um, okay. Potential cultural traits, DMs. Okay. Uh, this is going to really take some concentrated study and kind of walking through all this to kind of figure out um, how well this works. 
Um, does it pass some basic sniff tests, which is, you know, kind of a minimal expectation, but it's an expectation that I would be trying to feel whether it does or not. Uh, we've got a bunch of different cultural traits here, and I'm presumably we get a cultural, uh, uh, cultural profile. Indeed we do. Uh, the T5, oh, there is some discussion of the T5 cultural extension. Okay. Uh, very good. Religion in Traveler. Religion is, you know, it's always existed in Traveler. There are hints of it here and there. And that's another thing that is kind of left up to the referee. We know there are interstellar religions as well as local religions. And we have seen details on a few of those over the years in various products. Uh, but there's been no comprehensive guide to that. That's kind of up to you to figure out how that's supposed to work in your Traveler universe. Uh, but it's definitely not Fading Suns where there's a domineering sort of church to that tells everybody what they can and cannot do. Uh, here's some economic stuff. There's a resource factor, a labor factor, an infrastructure factor. And I'm guessing we're going to see a tie into T5 at the end of this too. There's an inequality rating, a world trade number. It kind of looks like we are, we are incorporating, we meaning the author, um, incorporating some of the ideas uh, first introduced in GURPS Traveler Far Trader, which kind of includes this very detailed economic, sort of macroeconomic system for Traveler, which you probably could use in any version of Traveler that's not GURPS Traveler, but it would take, you'd really need to make some adjustments, right? Because not all the assumptions are the same. Uh, starports, spaceports. Starports is interstellar. Spaceport is uh, anything that's capable of handling spacecraft. Uh, not just starships, but spacecraft, including shuttles and stuff like that. And those those can be pretty small. Uh, high port docking capacity, down port docking capacity. Boy, this is useful information. I, again, if you want it, right, you can, if, if especially if you're like a veteran traveler referee, you can just wing this stuff if you want to. and And that's fine. And if you're following like the, the sort of most traditional traveler campaign format where the expectation is probably that you're visiting a new planet every week or a couple of sessions at least, then um, you don't really need to ex exhaustively develop an individual planet. And you, you can totally just wing that because chances are you might not see that other planet again. All right. Uh, local military is very interesting. Bases. Naval bases, scout bases, military bases. Now, no discussion of pirate bases, though. Uh, travel zones, green, amber, and red. Here's the IISS procedural. Uh, here are the example planets. We're getting tons and tons of detail here. Special circumstance. Ooh, fascinating. Okay. Interesting that we're seeing this. Um, so, empty, first off, we start here with empty hexes. So, how do you treat an empty hex? Is there nothing in that hex? Are there, could there be rogue bodies in that hex? This provides a discussion of that, which is good. Um, because those are potential, like rogue gas giants are a potential refueling source. So, so, discovering a rogue planet in an empty hex, that's a gas giant that you could scoop from, uh, is a valuable piece of information. Then, then again, there's a vast amount of empty space in an empty hex. So, you know, finding it might be the problem. Empty hex objects. Okay, so presumably there's a way to determine this. Uh, you have also potentially got uh, neutron stars and black holes, white dwarfs. Uh, uh, do we consider white dwarf and, ro and neutron star and black hole systems? Because those would be detected, right? Um, to be empty hexes, maybe I would say no personally, but maybe the assumption is that yes, it could be there, there's a brown dwarf in that hex, right? Brown dwarves will, will probably be pretty good at finding too over the course of time, uh, but obviously they're hard to spot, but they're not that hard to spot uh, by modern technology. We know of quite a lot of them in the 30 or so light years closest to our solar system. Um, all right, jumping to empty hexes. Um, M drive efficiency in deep space. That's an issue, the way the M drive works. This is something that's kind of, this is the maneuver drive, like the standard thrusters on your ship as opposed to the jump drive. Um, this is always kind of fluctuated between versions of Traveler. Um, in classic Traveler, it's just kind of said, there is a maneuver drive and it can accelerate at this rating based on its rating. 
Um, and that's it. Mega Traveler introduced uh, a variety uh, uh, roster plates. I think that's where Mega Traveler showed up, or that might have been New Era. So different versions of Traveler have kind of tried to to pseudoscience this to different degrees. Um, the current set of assumptions in Mongoose Traveler Second Edition is kind of a blend of those, as as we've seen, as kind of as, which is kind of a characteristic of Mongoose Traveler Second Edition to try to take the best of all the previous versions of Traveler. Um, and turn it into one sort of cohesive package to whatever extent you think they succeeded is up to you to figure out. Um, the, the M drive is less efficient outside of gravity wells, and that is what this uh, is telling you, actually. Uh, primordial systems, okay, that's interesting. Brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, dead stars, neutron stars, black holes. Do we have uh, the... J minimum safe jump for black holes? That is something that has appeared. So... The safe jump distance is 100 diameters from a body, okay? And, and for planets and stars, that number passes the sniff test. Uh, for black holes, it doesn't because black holes are these massive compact objects. So in, uh, I want to say it's in the Great Rift box that there's a mechanism by which you can determine differently the minimum safe jump distance from a black hole. Um, maybe it is just 100 diameters. Mass is mass, right? That's the way it ought to work. That... That, to me, is the sniff test. So if we ignore that, um, but it, where it's going to fall, where it's going to flake is on the diameter, right? Because the diameter of the black hole is incredibly small for its mass. Um, so that number ceases to make sense. So the, the logical minimum safe jump would be, okay, I have a black hole with this mass. If that same mass was the mass of a star, what would the star look like? And then figure out the star's uh, 100 diameter limit. Um, that's not an astrographically rigorous way to figure it out, but you could figure it out that way. Uh, but that would not work for like even intermediate mass black holes, let alone supermassive black holes. Um, nebulae, or nebulae, artificial worlds, star clusters. Uh, there are some artificial worlds, including a partially complete Dyson sphere in the official Traveler universe. That's up in the Varger extents, I believe. Um, here's the procedural. Here's equipment. Um, it, it's always nice to have this equipment, but at the same time, it, it's a little frustrating to see equipment spread out over every single book. Um, every single book has equipment in it, and finding all the equipment is a pain in the ass. So, um, I mean, it's nice to have this. Here's a survey pod, a covert operations pod. Here's some robots that will help surveys. Um, here's uh, system surveyor software. Um, here are some spacecraft, hazardous environment exploration boat. Glad to have this stuff. Um, here's a glossary. Oh, that's actually pretty cool. Um, okay, so this is giving us a bu uh, definitions of a bunch of uh, either science fiction or astrophysics things that we may not necessarily need that we might not necessarily know off the top of our heads. Let me put it that way. <coughs> um, that we, we will find it useful to find, okay, what does luminosity really mean? Well, here it is. All right. So here is an outline of the new expanded and continuation system creation methods, which is great that this is here, including the formulas. So that's great. <coughs> Clearly not all the formulas, however. Here's physical characteristics. Here's social characteristics. Um, here's quick survey guide for exploration adventures. Um, uh, yeah, this is, this is talking about the basic, uh, methodology of the book too, in terms of, you know, you don't really need to do this for every system, right? And, and man, it would be difficult to do that. Here's designer's notes, uh, by author Gear Laniscog. Nice to see that. And one page, man, I could have, I could have put up with 10 pages of designer's notes from, uh, for this book. So, uh, this has been... Uh, the World Builders Guidebook for Mon oops shit uh, for Mongoose Traveler Second Edition. Um, so it looks like it's really valuable if you are the type of traveler referee that wants all this additional detail. Um, like for folks who've stuck with classic traveler all these years, I suspect that you may not want all this additional detail. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that you. Can, the only value in the book is this set of formulas and, and additional tables and stuff that you can roll on. Just reading through a lot of those discussions may prove valuable and insightful 
in kind of making those determinations as to what the UWP values mean for your Traveler game. So overall, I think the the at a glance, um, I, what I can't judge on right now is how well I think all the mechanisms hold up. I'm going to have to actually go through it to make that determination. At a glance, however, first impression is that the value of this book to you is going to be how much extra detail do you want the system to give you out of that basic UWP uh, profile, okay? If you really want a lot of additional detail, at least for some planets, then I would consider this an essential book. Um, if you don't, then I would consider this a kind of nice to have book um, in that it's going to give you a lot of discussion of a lot of those other factors and, you know, kind of figuring out what exotic atmosphere means and all that other stuff. Um, and then, but then you're not beholden to that. Um, as a general traveler advice, don't feel beholden to um, either canonical universe or to canonical system. Make the system do what, use the basic tools that traveler is giving you and make that do what you want it to do. That's good advice for any RPG. Um, but Traveler has so much material to develop the back end that that's exceptionally true in Traveler and is kind of true from both the player side where you kind of get the player facing rules and the referee facing rules. Um, Traveler works equally well both ways. And it's also always been pretty modular. You've always had these extra systems that you can use to provide you with more back-end or front-end detail if you want. So that's my initial analysis of the World Builders Guidebook. We're newly released. It'll be relatively newly released when you see the video. Uh, for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition, I am fairly impressed with this book. I will be delighted to add it to my shelves when the physical copy arrives. Um, and I am avidly following what uh, Gear Lanniskog is doing with Mongoose Traveler right now because I think there's a lot of really good information uh, coming from him and a lot of good products. Massive thanks to the patrons of Ardwolf Slayer whose support and encouragement make what we do at Ardwolf Slayer possible. Thank you, patrons. Links to help support the channel are in the video description, so check out the Patreon, the Ko-Fi, and the merch store where you can get snazzy Ardwolf Slayer t-shirts, drinking vessels, and other cool swag. There is also an affiliate link for Noble Knight Games in the video description. If you buy stuff through that affiliate link, it helps us support the channel with Noble Knight store credit. Thank you, Noble Knight. Until next time, thanks for watching, and happy gaming.